thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for the warmth of your welcome. What I appreciated so much about your welcome is that it was not excessive. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I've done this show in many different parts of the world by now. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, Madrid, Athens, uh, Bergen, Norway, Kuala Lumpur, and it's always been full of surprises. In Kuala Lumpur, I didn't know before I got there, it's the capital of Malaysia, as all of you know, uh, I didn't know they had no theatre there, and I was reduced to performing in the ballroom of a hotel. Also, I had no labour permit, and so my uh, passport was retained at the airport. I got it just before I went on the stage, and to this day is printed on it, um, permission to appear for one night only as comic, in a certain ballroom, expressly forbidden for sitting out or dancing with the public. <laughs> I asked what this meant. They said it was a regulation they'd had to bring in to cope with the activities of itinerant prostitutes. <laughs> and there was no special heading for me. So, in the intermission, uh, <laughs> sometimes there are even greater surprises closer to home. For instance, after a performance in Vienna, I crossed the German frontier at about 11 o'clock in the morning by car. It was a lovely spring day. The German customs officials seemed very affable. Good morning. Welcome to Germany. Passport. Put your car over there, come straight to my office. I am keeping your passport. Well, that sounds disagreeable enough in English. <laughs> I was livid. I parked the car, got out. He was already transformed completely, coming towards me with the passport. I have a good trip. <laughs> I said, why did you shout at me like that? Oh, <laughs> A morning mood. <laughs> I said, no, no, there must be more to it than that. You must tell me the reason. You can't just ignore it. I must know why you did it. He said, I'll be honest with you. Every day when we come to work, before we start, we are forced to look once again at all the photographs of known terrorists. And I knew I'd seen your face someday. <laughs> Sometimes we take sabbaticals from these, these trips, and uh, we did a six-part uh, television series about the Vatican. I discovered that the Vatican uh, switchboard is composed entirely of nuns in full habit. And this has a certain disadvantage in summer when the air conditioning is on. It's quite an old-fashioned keyboard. And um, if you ask to speak, uh, in some respects, of course, they have become more modern. Uh, when you ask to speak for, to um, Cardinal Berlusconi, for instance, I don't know if there is one, but there obviously soon will be, um, you say to the nun, she says, pronto. You say, ah, posso parlare al Cardinale Berlusconi, per favore? Un momento! Ave Maria! Pronto! Well, many of these stories are based on misapprehensions and mistakes, and I have one which is really puts the whole of my attitude towards this in a nutshell. It's a story I heard from the retiring British ambassador to Tunis about 30 years ago now, 
at a time when China was re-entering the comity of nations, and he, as doyen of the diplomatic corps there, had to welcome the new Chinese ambassador, who arrived as a forerunner of the full embassy staff, with only his interpreter. And the poor British ambassador had to labor up the inside of a cliff in full regalia in summer to perform this function. And it didn't take anyone more gifted in foreign languages than the average British ambassador <laughs> to realize that the Chinese ambassador and his translator had some difficulty understanding each other. <laughs> And when the British ambassador arrived, and the Chinese ambassador said to his translator, something like, <laughs> This seemed to irritate the Chinese ambassador who said, <laughs> Nothing worked until the ambassador pulled his translator behind a screen and did a quick watercolor of a teacup. <laughs> and while the translator was making tea, the British ambassador and the Chinese ambassador smiled at each other in the manner in which they had been taught at their respective diplomatic academies. <laughs> Eventually, tea arrived, and the British ambassador thought he could move the conversation onto a broader base. <laughs> and he said to the Chinese translator, uh, would you kindly inform His Excellency of my delight at being able to welcome him to Tunis, and further express my conviction that any talks we may have in the future will only serve to still further ameliorate the already excellent uh, relations enjoyed by our two great nations. The Chinese ambassador contemplated this for a moment. <laughs> and the translator said to the British ambassador, how about Friday? <laughs> In case it be thought that I think ill of translators, the very opposite is true. I've noticed on my travels that many very serious and grave international crises have been avoided by the fact that translators have mistranslated the words of statesmen. <laughs> and I've even noticed in the United Nations that even in improvised debates using that little box, that very often the translators have overtaken the orators. <laughs> well, I was born in this sort of atmosphere. My father was eventually uh, a diplomat. At the beginning, uh, when he was uh, uh, sent to London, he was a representative of the German news agency in London at a very awkward period of history, just after the First World War. I was born in London, but I had been conceived in St. Petersburg, which shows that I traveled a great deal before birth <laughs> as extra weight, and have continued to do so ever since. <laughs> my father went ahead, my mother followed with me, of course, I hadn't been born yet, and uh, she was completely inexperienced in anything outside Russia, apart from two short visits to France. She arrived in Harwich on the east coast of England and took the train in a swirling fog, which was usual in those days, to join her husband in London. And uh, inexperienced in the uh, Western alphabet or the English language, she was very perplexed by the fact that every station between Harwich and London seemed to be called Bovril. <laughs> A 
Eventually, we arrived in London. I was born. We had a very small flat with thin walls. And my, my father uh, dictated his reports at about 2 o'clock in the morning when the lines were free. There were very few lines. Nothing was as it is today. And I heard him always regularly every night through the wall shouting at dictation speed into the phone to Berlin, Lloyd George! hat heute im Unterhaus gesagt, Einführungsstriche. Ach, Fräulein, muss ich alles wieder zweimal überholen. Well, it stands to reason that as a baby I slept very little, but I did learn German. I quickly noticed that my parents were far too bohemian to indulge in any of the diversions favored by other young people at that period. They had no radio. They had no radio until I was old enough to buy them one. I was 41 at the time. <laughs> and they were addicted to it. It was often on all night in case they missed something. Car motor cars were another thing. I was an only child, and I knew I would be one somehow. And uh, I was just in love with motor cars. My parents didn't even understand them. My father never understood why a taxi couldn't drop him in the middle of the road. Why did he have to go to one pavement or the other when he hadn't yet decided which one he wanted to go to? <laughs> My mother was always taken by surprise by the direction in which a taxi moved off in once she had taken her place. <laughs> it was obviously hopeless. So to compensate for this lack, I became a car myself. I used to switch on in bed in the morning. <laughs> Sometimes in winter, it was very difficult. When it was too difficult, I didn't go to school. And um, my father got very worried about this because I never spoke. And it was only one day when I was confined to the garage by illness that I was able to tell him, you can't speak and be a motor car at the same time. Uh, he wasn't really reassured at all about this. But when I was six years old, I was still being a car all day long, talking very little. And I was now more sophisticated. I was changing gear a lot more <laughs> with a double D clutch, which was necessary in those days to get the thing in. And very often I didn't get it in because I liked the noise of it not being able to go in. <laughs> and we went off to Estonia in the Baltic in order to meet my mother's father, my grandfather whom I'm very privileged to have met. I never met the other one. But this one was the court architect of the Tsar and became overnight the first president of the Soviet Academy of Fine Arts. He was a very intelligent old gentleman and very flexible. And uh, I like to show off in front of him by changing gear the whole time. <laughs> it was really quite useless because Estonia is a flat country. But it got on my mother's nerves. She had a toothache and she flared up one day and shouted at me and her father said, don't shout at him. Think of that sound, not as that of a motor car, but rather that of his imagination developing and you will see it will be tolerable. <laughs> I don't think it was tolerable for a moment, but I was very grateful for the old man for coming in on my side. Estonia was a very beautiful country, it still is. A very beautiful country, very much like provincial Russia, with white slatted wooden houses, collapsing verandas, broken steps. You got splinters from everything you touched. I spent the whole of my summer holiday taking bits of wood out of myself. And there was this pervasive smell of drying apples and drying mushrooms. And on the tables and the verandas, huge, bowls of homemade yogurt inadequately defended against the squadrons of flies that <laughs> circled overhead. And my grandfather in his 80s appeared with a fly swat. <laughs> and he explained to me, flies are bad for the health. They uh, spread disease from person to person and they must be <laughs> eliminated. I was already very keen on tennis. I borrowed the fly swat, imagined I was at the net, and killed hundreds of flies. 
And he watched me for a while and then suddenly said, Give me that thing back. Give me that, that thing, that thing with one in your hand. Give me back. I said, Why? You tell me that flies are bad, hmm, bad for the health. There are still quite a lot of them around. He said, Give me that thing back. <laughs> Better we should all be slightly ill than that you should acquire a taste for killing. <laughs> well, then it was time for me to go to school for the first time. I remember it vividly. School in London, I was six years old. There was a large oleograph on the wall of the classroom of Jesus Christ holding a Boy Scout by the hand. <laughs> and with the other available hand, pointing out to the Boy Scout the extent of the British Empire on the map. <laughs> Put it down to my foreign background, if you will, but I was pretty skeptical from the start. <laughs> But I was fascinated by religion, all these new characters, the glozing of morality, which I felt, but it had never been formulated before. And at Christmas, I was taken off to Harrods department store to receive a present. It was all rather embarrassing. I thought uh, the parents bought a present and then took it to Father Christmas. And then my mother pointed me out to him. And then Father Christmas would call out, Oh, yeah, no, not you, the other little boy. Yeah. <laughs> you sit on his knee and you got your present. Well, I didn't want to go through that. I ran out of Harrods, I escaped, ran the whole length of the shop, was captured by my parents trying to cross the road against the stream of traffic. I know now how embarrassing these things are because the passers-by always assume that the child is being maltreated. The child knows exactly what the passers-by assume. <laughs> but the reason I didn't want to go to Harrods was because I was convinced that King Herod lived there. <laughs> and I might not come out alive. You see what a little religious education will do for a boy. <laughs> I had the same experience many years later when I had three children of my own, all eager to meet Father Christmas. This was in New York, and I took them out, and we came round the corner of a street, and there were 12 Father Christmases <laughs> engaged in a union meeting. I gave up the idea of telling them more about Father Christmas and I instead told them about the rudiments of the trades union movement. <laughs> well, it was a school that was supposed to be quite go ahead. I had no proof of that. I remember it started, the longest memory as I have is of, uh, of uh, general knowledge questions which started fairly soon after I got there. One of them I thought was rather foolish, I must say, and still think so, of course. It was, who is the greatest composer that ever lived? Mozart. The correct answer was Beethoven. <laughs> I was heard to mutter that I thought the whole procedure was very unfair to Bach. <laughs> and I was made to write out a hundred times, Beethoven is the greatest composer who ever lived. I think it's a tribute to his greatness that I can still tolerate his music to this day. <laughs> a little later, the questions became broader in scope. One of them was, name one Russian composer. I put down Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov. The correct answer... <laughs> ...was Tchaikovsky. And uh, after the school authorities had looked up Rimsky-Korsakov in the encyclopedia, I was upbraided before the whole school by a mistress who told me I had been showing off. <laughs> no, 
That was my first premature brush with Thatcherism. I got one result in that school I wouldn't have believed unless my mother had shown me personally. It was written by the headmaster who said, he shows great originality which must be curbed at all costs. <laughs> I did my first theatricals in that school. The first time I ever stood on a stage in front of a public was in the part of a pig. <laughs> I don't remember the theme of the play now, but uh, all I remember is the terrible smell of glue on the inside of the pig mask I was forced to wear in case there was any mistake. <laughs> The only other part I played, oh, and the headmaster wrote about that too in the end of term. He said that I had been adequate in the part of a pig. <laughs> the only other part I was allowed to play was that of a nymph <laughs> who was trying to lure Ulysses onto the rocks. And I must say, I quite understood it when Ulysses just sailed by. <laughs> they had school sports in those days, I think they still do. But these were rather remarkable because there was a father's race, there was a mother's race, and believe it or not, a chauffeur's race. <laughs> My father declined to run in the father's race for what I thought were rather specious reasons. He used to wear a monocle in those days. I never thought he really needed it. I noticed it switched from eye to eye. <laughs> and he explained to me that if he were to run in the father's race, he would be bound to be winning it. And perhaps in a moment of aberration, the glass might slip from his eye and be trodden underfoot by the other fathers running, of course, behind him. <laughs> I was very upset by this. My mother saw the extent of my dismay, and so she volunteered to run in the mother's race. I wish she hadn't. <laughs> she was still on the track when the race after that one began. <laughs> I've already explained we didn't have a motor car. It would really have been too eccentric to have had a chauffeur. <laughs> but I had a good friend at school with a very wealthy father, and that father had two chauffeurs and my friend offered to lend me the slower of the two. <laughs> but I couldn't take that kind of humiliation. I left school, not for that reason, of course, no. I just reached an age in which one moved on, and I was sent to Westminster School in the heart of London, near the Abbey and the House of Parliament, in a very leafy, cloistered atmosphere. And here I was, at the age of 13, sent to school with a top hat on, uh, tailcoat, hard collar, pinstripe trousers, and in my hand, a furled umbrella. It said in the school prospectus that the furled umbrella was there to distinguish us from City of London bank messengers. <laughs> but since most of those were in their early 80s, <laughs> I would have thought there were other means of telling us apart. Anyway, in this leafy ecclesiastical atmosphere near the Abbey, we all looked absolutely ridiculous. We were all very small, the umbrellas were very large, and we all looked like premature bishops as we walked around. <laughs> I was very unhappy at that school. It was, it was uh, segregated, it was only for boys, and I think the, the segregation of the sexes went on for far too long with results which you can sometimes read about in the tabloid press. <laughs> today it's quite different. I go bath guide occasionally, and today it is co-educational. They're dressed conveniently and comfortably, and as a consequence, talking to them today is like talking to young adults instead of the overblown school children we wear. Anyway, <clears throat> my mother decided, and I, I am afraid I agreed with her, that I could never pass an exam in such an establishment. And so I was sent to a drama school. Well, I must say that despite my early experiences as a nymph and as a pig, <laughs> the theatre was never a vocation for me. I never was drawn towards it, really, simply because I didn't understand how actors learned all those lines. 
And now, having played King Lear twice, I still don't understand how this <laughs> After all, with a motor car, a modern car, you switch on, you see logos of all the things that are working. Uh, an actor has no, no, no possibility of switching anything on or of knowing anything about himself. And you go on for four and a half hours on a stage and you start very coldly, very calculatedly aiming every shot and then gradually the engine warms up, you forget all about that and you begin to enter into the spirit of the play and at last, four and a half hours later, you fall dead on the stage with a sigh of relief which I hope cannot be heard by the audience. <laughs> but then, that is the worst time. Now you have to lie still while seven more pages are spoken very slowly <laughs> out of deference to your death. And gradually, as it goes on, an, an intolerable itch develops on your ankle. <laughs> and you can't move. And you try thinking of other things. And still they seem to be talking more and more slowly. The next night, having recovered that somehow, you decide to die in another way. <laughs> so that your greatcoat goes over that ankle. So that if it happens again, without creating too many ripples on its surface, you could, at a pinch, move the other foot <laughs> and seek relief. But nothing happens the second night. Instead, the itch is transferred to your nostril. <laughs> That's what I carry away from King Lear, is not the fear of going on, but those seven last terrible minutes when you're waiting for this to happen. Well, of course, these are, these are late days. When I went to the drama school, it was quite different. I didn't know any of that yet. And in fact, they, it was a go-ahead drama school, which later became the old Vic school. They didn't want us to attack uh, difficult texts like Brecht or Shakespeare straight away. They wanted us to gradually broaden our horizons, begin to discover the possibilities of the human body and of the human voice. And to that end, they asked us for the first term to be animals of our choice. Well, you had to be very careful what animal you chose, because under those circumstances, a term can be a very long time. <laughs> and there was one girl, my heart still goes out to her to this day. She suffered from every blight of adolescence, all at the same time. She had acne, she had enlarged pores, blackheads, oily skin, alopecia, she was anemic, and she came from South Africa, with a terrible nostalgia for the open countryside and the veldt, and I'm sure it's for patriotic reasons, she elected to be a springbok. <laughs> I don't think it was a wise choice. I don't know whether you've seen springbok. Very few people have, because they defy even the speed of modern cameras. When they are captured, they're usually between two rocks quite high up, and with all four feet off the ground. <laughs> and uh, she did everything she could. She jumped nimbly on and off furniture all term long. She climbed the staircase, but outside the banister on that tiny room. <laughs> she gave us one heart attack after the other. I have no idea whether she was a good springbok or not. But she ended the term much diminished. She was in such a state of moral and, and physical distress that she went home and we never saw her again. <laughs> I was a salamander. <laughs> I had a relatively restful turn. Then came the end of the drama school, and at last the freedom which so many young people yearn for, unemployment as well, but the freedom was more important at that moment. The ability to make your own mistakes at last, after always having made them of other people under duress. But war broke out, and we all went back to school again. It was a more lethal school, but it was still a school. 
I appeared in some terrible drab drill hall in front of my first officer. He said to me, <laughs> What arm would you care to serve in if given as a choice? I said, I'd rather be in tank, sir. Nobody else had said that. He was very intrigued. Why tank? I said, because I'd rather go into battle sitting down. <laughs> I think it was still the salamander talking. <laughs> but the fact is, I was sent straight to the infantry. I don't know what, whether I knew what to expect. When you see uh, non-commissioned officers interviewed on television these days, they always seem to me rational and compassionate and intelligent people. But in those days, my God. <laughs> I thought they'd come to us straight from the Crimean War with only a coffee break in between. <laughs> we were in an awful billet in Margate on the east coast of England, windswept on the sea front. And there were eight of us in a tiny room, most insanitary. After two weeks, we were moved to something slightly more salubrious, but not much. And we had a sergeant major who was punch drunk. He kept on avoiding imaginary blows. He would say every now and then, like a metronome, stand up then. Stand up then. Even when you were lying beside your rifle, stand up then. And as you struggled to your feet, you never understood what he wanted. And I ran into him just after we'd moved to the more salubrious billet Saw him in the street, he stopped me. Morning, Yeknoff. <laughs> that was my name in the army, Yeknoff. <laughs> Morning, Yeknoff. How's your new Billy, eh? <laughs> I said, it's much better, thank you, sir. It's, uh, it's much less congested. <laughs> I know. More room too, in there. <laughs> He had an assistant who was almost worse. Very erect young sergeant. You never saw his eyes, because he affected one of those British military caps which precluded that possibility. <laughs> but his mouth was always chomping on something. Then I discovered that he was 24 years old. He had lost all his teeth already, and the new ones had been ordered from the Army Dental Corps in 1937. <laughs> and they hadn't arrived yet. And he used to watch parcels arrive and follow them to their destination. When it was me, he said, Yuknoff, any cake? Well, I was such a coward, I gave him cake until I noticed he was worse after the cake than before. Then I changed my technique. I said, no, no, I haven't got any. Oh, I tell you what I have got, Sergeant, I've got some toffee. He also used the English language in a very special way. Seeing we were on the seaside, along the front there, he used to threaten us. If you do that again, I'm going to have the whole lot of you running up and down the escapade. Is that clear? <laughs> and I remember he introduced us to a new grenade which had just been brought in by the British Army, a small bacalite thing like that, very sensitive and quite horrible. And he said, I want you to look at this very carefully, is that clear? It is a new grenade, you follow me. And it is highly detrimental to enemy morals. <laughs> well, one day we'd done something wrong, we were running up and down the escapade as usual. <laughs> he was late on parade, he suddenly arrived, completely transformed. He looked as if he'd been sitting for El Greco. The teeth had arrived. <laughs> Go on! All right! All right! All right! Well, I always found orders in the British Army practically incomprehensible. <laughs> this one really took the biscuit.
until he fell to the ground, blood oozing out of his mouth. He had bitten right through his tongue. I left that unit before he returned from hospital, so I'm afraid I can't give you a progress report. But the war dribbled to an end, and at last I was able to rejoin a profession that I had been trained for as a salamander <laughs> and made some friends, some of whom are still, thank God, alive. One was Alec Guinness, who's a wonderful character, demure, secret, and yet what a fount of wit and intelligence when it's called for. Like all actors, he had secrets. Some of them are realized, others not. One strange one which obsessed him was that he was dying to play the part of Hitler. And he managed to do it in a film which was not really terribly good, but he was absolutely magical. Much better than Hitler would have been. <laughs> but his anticipation of that was spoiled when he heard that Dustin Hoffman had been approached to play the part. <laughs> he did something absolutely uncharacteristic. He went out and rented a Hitler costume his size. He made up meticulously, as he always did, and then, together with a photographer, went out in the street in London to have some photographs made which would prove to the producers there was only one man fit to play the part of Hitler. And he had studied his quarry with all the acuity and even cruelty at his command. He knew that Hitler didn't stand still very often, but moved around in a little gavotte step of his own. Nobody in the street took the slightest notice of him. <laughs> Dogs passed by, relieved themselves on the plane trees. <laughs> Old ladies passed with young children. Come on, Caroline, don't dawdle, dear. I've got a lot to get through. Come on! The only person who took any notice of Alec Guinness was an elderly policeman who sidled up to him as he was addressing the Nuremberg rally for the photographer. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Is that your car over there? <laughs> it's on a double yellow line, you know, sir. It's not really supposed to be there. However, I'm only going to warn you on this occasion. I'm not going to give you a ticket since I have no intention of spending the rest of my life in a concentration camp. <laughs> Another wonderful character, of course, is Sir John Gielgud, who's wonderfully tactful with young actors. He makes them feel immediately at home, destroys the barrier which appears between different generations. He's perhaps a little more himself within the profession than outside it, but he has an extraordinary penchant for the faux pas. He's very gifted in that direction. <laughs> and he knows it and is very amusing about it. Uh, he's, I've always told him that he's like someone who's learning to ride a bicycle late in life. There's an absolutely naked landscape with one tree in it, and he's drawn towards the tree. <laughs> he did one faux pas for me alone. I'm sure it was for me. I'm sure nobody else noticed. It happened in St. Louis, Missouri, which, believe me, is no temple of the arts. <laughs> I tried to get a few laughs in a play of mine in front of a handful of people, hadn't worked, returned home disgruntled, turned on the television, and suddenly on channel 35 or something like that, there was Sir John being interviewed by a young professor from some minor seat of learning out on the Great Plains. <laughs> and as the set warmed up, the young professor said, uh, I think we, we have time for one final question, Sir, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Gud. Um, <laughs> did you ever have a man in your life, or, or a woman, I, I, or both? Hell, I don't know. You, 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 who pointed out the way ahead to you and said, yes, sir, that is the road that you are destined to travel. And by now, John had understood the gist of the question. And he replied, Yes, I think there was. 
when I was to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. There was a wonderful man there who helped us all a great deal. Claude Rains. <laughs> I don't know what happened to him. I think he failed and went to America. <laughs> Then there was Charles Lawton, who was always hanging around, waiting to be offended. <laughs> he wore his white hair very long, but in order to go out in the street, he put them into red curlers, the way that some American ladies affect in, uh, in supermarkets. <laughs> And uh, he wore a sports shirt, blue jean trousers, and sandals. He looked distinctly odd. <laughs> he came to our rented house to discuss the script. My son, who was four and a half years old, came in with the best intentions and said, Who is this lady? <laughs> I want you to remember this name. It's not a lady. Charles Lawton. He's a friend of your father's, a wonderful actor. He's a man. My son said, then why's he got breasts? <laughs> I remember Charles floating on his back in his own pool, a voluptuous figure. He was the exact opposite of an iceberg. Nine-tenths of him was visible. <laughs> then there were the directors. They're largely forgotten today, but they were very influential at the time. There was one called Michael Kurtiz. He was a Hungarian, really. His name was Kertes. And he had directed a Casablanca. And nobody could quite understand how he'd done it. Because he, he was very tall, balding, elegant, extremely elegant, with huge blue eyes, which seemed to have no pupils to them. You could go right up to him and have a look, he didn't notice. <laughs> and he'd been in America a long time, but he'd never really learned English. But he had forgotten his Hungarian. The first two days, I didn't understand a word he said, and I called on Jean Simmons to help me. She's a charming woman. She said, uh, I said, what, how do you deal with this man? She said, you don't. You do exactly what you think is right, and if it's atrocious, he's bound to find a way of telling you. Although, she said, I don't know, I, this is the second film I'm doing with him, and he hasn't talked to me yet. <laughs> well, the next day, by some chance, we were all sitting around waiting to work, and he wandered into our midst with these strange blue, sightless looking eyes, and out of the blue he said, <laughs> Life! I said, Yes. <laughs> he said, I remember when I was barefoot boy with my brother. We were in the theater in Vienna serving sweets and magazine programs. <laughs> Today, Hollywood. That's life. That's what it is, life. Life. I thought perhaps on this narrow premise I might build a more permanent friendship. I didn't quite see how. But when I got home, the only letter to have followed me from Europe was from Vienna and from a theater, from the Theater in der Josefstadt, a beautiful Baroque building. They were rehearsing a play of mine, and they were la asking a lot of purely technical questions of no interest to anybody else. But the letter was on a superb Baroque letterhead, with nymphs and shepherds spilling a horn of plenty onto the page and anybody using that stationery had to avoid the pears and the apples that tumbled out <laughs> into the I thought maybe the letterhead would remind him of further anecdotes. 
So as he came on the stage the next day, I said to him in the morning, you know, uh, Mike, yesterday you were telling us about Vienna. He said, no, not yesterday, goddamn. Long time ago when I was barefoot boy <laughs> with my brother. <laughs> yesterday we was here, you know that. <laughs> Why tell me I was in Vienna? <laughs> so I said, yeah, but yeah, it's all right. The only letter to have followed me from Europe is this. And I showed him the letterhead. He took it and didn't bother about the letterhead, but tried to read the letter among the fruit. <laughs> didn't understand what it was about. Put it in his pocket and went on working. <laughs> I now had to get it back because I had to answer the letter. I tried all day long without any hope at all. As he was going home in the evening, I waylaid him. I said, Mike, you have a letter belonging to me. He said, no. I'm not the kind of director write letter to actor. Then I want to tell you, stink, I'm doing it face on face. <laughs> I said, yes, all right, but you have a letter which is addressed to me. When it's addressed to you, go to the post office. They got all the different <laughs> addresses. I said, you have a letter addressed to me from Vienna. He said, Vienna. I remember when I was there to <laughs> go. Then there was Mervyn Leroy, who directed Quo Vadis. I was very keen to humor him because I'd never met him before. And uh, I had this immense part, which was uh, wonderful for a person of my age. And uh, he, I saw for the first time on a huge empty stage, oh, there was already some columns there, of course, it was a Roman film, in Rome. And I approached him, he was there with his cigar, little man, smiling. I said, Mr. Leroy, how are you, darling? <laughs> I'm all right, thank you very much. <laughs> I just wondered whether you had any pointers for me in the, in the part of, of Nero. Nero, son of a bitch. <laughs> yes, I said, there's that. Um, <laughs> perhaps between us we can find something a little subtler, a little more shady. <laughs> and I tried to back away, saying to myself, five months with this is going to be absolutely more than I can bear. <laughs> when he suddenly had a fresh idea just before I disappeared, and he said to me, the way I see Nero, this is the guy, the kind of guy plays with himself nights. <laughs> I didn't immediately see how to... <laughs> I thought it was rather silly. But now, 40 years later, I begin to wonder if that isn't the profoundest thing ever said about me. <laughs> and it's confirmed my suspicion, which has been growing over all these years, that the Americans are the only people capable of doing ancient Rome justice. <laughs> well, they're so much alike. <laughs> the hottest day, the hottest... <laughs> Ave. <laughs> it was the hottest day this century that we actually burned Rome. It was terrible outside. On the, sta on the stage, it was absolutely excruciating. The whole of Rome was burning in model shot. There was more fires behind. And we were standing on a crenellated tower in the middle. I was standing there with my laurel wreath and toga, ready with my lyre to play the hysterical song of pleasure. And uh, I was, not only were we covered with black spots from the braziers that were burning everywhere, intolerable fumes and our nostrils were all larger than they really were in life. And I had on top of it all green rivers running down over my eyes, which came from the inferior metal in my laurel wreath. <laughs> I looked more like Oedipus Rex than Nero. <laughs> Behind me were two old actors dressed as uh, senators, one of whom had asthma, 
And I remember thinking to myself, if he stops coughing, he's dead. <laughs> And down there on the floor was an American lady from the American College of Music in Rome with her sheath dress stuck to her with perspiration. She had a huge harp in front of her and she called up to me in friendly fashion as I stood there and said, do what you like with your hands, honey, I'll follow you. <laughs> Suddenly the whole structure began shaking and I recognized that somebody was climbing the outside. It was Mervyn Leroy, who appeared with his cigar to add to the pollution, and said, don't forget, you're responsible for all this. <laughs> well, as a final anecdote, from the intense heat of Rome to the intense cold of London in, in November, Six o'clock in the morning at Woolwich, Arsenal, Barracks. There was a red sun in the sky which you could stare at without doing your eyes any damage, whatever. <laughs> Every time you opened your mouth, little captions came out and frittered away to nothing. <laughs> the film was Beau Brummel. I was playing the Prince Regent. And there were 750 horsemen from the Household Brigade on rather nervous horses already in position. I had a helmet with feathers on it. I had a cuirass and my face in between was reduced to two rolls of fat. <laughs> and I was wearing breeches made of that mysterious material that lets out the heat and lets in the cold. <laughs> I was absolutely miserable. And for the first time in my life, I was dying to be on a horse simply because I couldn't stand on the ground. I was at last in position and waiting to go over there was Elizabeth Taylor in an open carriage with a handful of very small miniature poodles. You could just hear them from where I was. <laughs> they were very unhappy because they were cut like hedges. <laughs> half of them was freezing, the other half overheated. <laughs> very unfair on an animal the size of a fountain pen. Over there was Stuart Granger galloping up and down between rows of suspended lemons, cutting them in half with his sabre. It was a very well thought of sport in those days. Never quite made it to the Olympics, but it was... <laughs> and then a man was going to gallop towards me, rear his horse, and say, for the purposes of cinema, and say, the parade is ready for your inspection, your royal highness. And I was supposed to salute negligently and trot off to do my duty. Before we went, there was just time for the man in charge of the horses to come over to me. Why do you look so miserable up there? <laughs> you know, if you were here a day or two longer, you'd be playing with that horse like you do with a, with a kitten. I'm not exaggerating, he's a lovely animal. I've known him since, oh, since he was born. Yes. Anyway, what are you supposed to do just do what you're paid for. Act. Ignore the horse. Ignore him. Don't touch him. Don't speak to him. Leave him alone. He knows better than you nor I what to do. In case there's any trouble, I'm only just out of sight. And he knows my voice, don't he? <laughs> so we started. The dogs were still barking, a little softer, I thought. <laughs> George Granger was going ahead, all guns. And the man galloped in my direction. And as he galloped, I had a strange feeling that my saddle... <laughs> and I felt behind me to see whether the saddle was still central to the horse. And the other man reared his horse and mine immediately knelt. <laughs> we had to cut and the man in charge of the horses came over. What are you doing? <laughs> I thought you were going to ignore the horse and just act. You touched the horse, didn't you? <laughs> all right, it's a circus horse. I don't have to let you into all my secrets, do I? <laughs> so we tried once more, immediately after lunch. 
And uh, I promised not to touch anything. I just sat there. The dogs were now scarcely audible. <laughs> Stuart Granger, sir, I don't think he broke for lunch. He went on through the lunch. And, <laughs> and once again, the man came galloping in my direction. <laughs> And as I looked down, I suddenly saw to my horror I had three reins in one hand and only one in the other. How do I get them across? I thought, when that horse is rearing, nobody will be watching me. I'll just flick it up and catch it very quickly. <laughs> well, I flicked it up but missed. And it fell across the horse's mane. And when his horse went up, so did mine. <laughs> and I slid off the back. You're making a monkey out of that horse. You're making a monkey out of me. You're not doing yourself much good neither. <laughs> well, at four o'clock we tried once more. The light held, they said. By now, the dogs were completely inaudible. <laughs> Stuart Granger was... The man came towards me. I was sitting there absolutely inanimate with my hands up here to avoid all contact with the horse. And he reared his horse and said, The uh, parade is ready for your inspection, your royal highness. And I saluted back, uh, very cramped. And now we were in virgin territory. And behind me I suddenly heard, broke loose. <laughs> when you're sitting on a horse, you can't see its face. <laughs> all you can go by the ears, and they were going all over the place. <laughs> I even had a feeling at one moment they were consulting each other. <laughs> anyway, the horse behaved admirably except it did react, as all living things do, if too frightened. <laughs> Let everything go. But I mean everything. And on this cold November afternoon, I suddenly couldn't see anyone else. Through the fog, I heard a voice <laughs> shouting, Cut it! God damn it, I can't see the prince. <laughs> I think, I think, I think both you and the horse stand in need of the trough. wondered about important people because they usually let us down usually because they don't have time to show us why they're important <laughs> and it's not conclusions we can jump to without their help <laughs> and I was thinking about this when I was asked by the BBC to do an interview with my great uncle uh, he had done many famous ballets like Petrushka and was one of the founders of the Russian ballet. And I asked him questions of a kind that I would never have dreamt of asking anybody less venerable. I said to him, you must have known Tolstoy. And he said, Tolstoy? Whoa! <laughs> no, I never knew Tolstoy. 
I said, why did, you try, why did you give me the impression you did know him? Well, you know, I was a poor painter in St. Petersburg, and one day I received an invitation for the weekend to Yasnaya Palyana, where was living Tolstoy. I was very honored. This poor painter invited by this monument. Oh, <laughs> I accepted. And then as the time for the weekend approached, I began to be nervous. I thought to myself, it's going to be a dreadful weekend. If it's not snowing, it will be raining, and we will be forced to go country rambles, always with Tolstoy, country rambles, mending shoes with the peasants, always crossing rivers and, oh, oh no. I, I sent a telegram saying I had been taken ill. <laughs> I said, don't you ever regret having sent that telegram? No, no, I won't send that telegram. <laughs> I think my uncle was right, you see, because I don't think he could have got anything from Tolstoy under those circumstances that he couldn't get better from a book. And I, I mean, if Beethoven was to come here tonight, even if I let him on. <laughs> We'd all be miserably disappointed, because you could hear a pin drop here. We'd all have recognized him off the CD covers. <laughs> and what would he say when we listened to him with such, with such eagerness? It's, the weather is so changeable. Yesterday was still what? And today is... is uh, it's, uh, uh, I think I wear mittens for tomorrow's program. <laughs> and how would that advance our knowledge of him? Not an iota. I've been thinking about this very carefully. The only way to be great in this world is to be dead. <laughs> no more small talk. Finished. I know three stories about three great men. They're all dead. That's a proof. There you are. De Gaulle. De Gaulle was about to pass in review some war veterans of the First World War with their rakish berets, their medals, their banners, and in the background, a rather hysterical French military music. <laughs> and he was prevented from going on the parade ground by his equerry, Mon Général. Oui. Mon Général, don't look now, but the penultimate row, the third man from the right, Dupont, he served with you on the Somme. Ah, oh, très bien, merci, merci. The girl goes down the line, stops in front of the old man and says, Alors, Dupont! And the old man said, Good God, de Gaulle, whatever happened to you? <laughs> In happier times, Belgrade, Marshal Tito at the end of a refectory table, here the American ambassador's wife, and where I am, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Bjedic, a very corpulent, rather coarse Muslim from Bosnia, an old friend of Tito's from the heroic days above the cloud level fighting the Nazis. And now this Prime Minister wanted to tell the American ambassador some anecdotes from that war, uh, but he didn't want to get it in the way of his eating. <coughs> and on the third day, we were attacking the Germans. And Tito noticed, and Tito said, Bjerdic, and on the fourth day, <coughs> there was dive bombing. <coughs> Bjerdic, and on the fifth day, <coughs> Bjerdic, yes, knife. Who? <laughs> then there's a rather tragic story about General Franco. He had been in a coma for six weeks in his palace outside Madrid, moribund, motionless. And his daughter was pottering around, rearranging photographs and 
watering plants that had already been watered far too frequently. <laughs> and suddenly there was a stir in the street outside the palace, and the noise of that stir mysteriously penetrated the coma, and suddenly, without any warning, Franco went, Ah! Oh, yeah! What was that noise? Oh, Father, it's the Spanish people, Father. They've come to say goodbye. Where are they going? <laughs> Then, of course, we come to those who are still gratefully alive. Uh, I was very honored to be invited with my wife to the White House on the occasion of a state visit of Prince Charles and Lady Di. The incumbents at that time were still the Reagans. It was a wonderful banquet served at individual tables of eight. The host at my table was Nancy Reagan. Very charming. And uh, my immediate neighbor was a ballerina who was very intellectual, very nice. And, uh, but uh, she did seem to me to have a greater predilection for flowers than for people. Anyway, we then heard the teaspoon against the wine glass. We all turned round and there... Well... I just want to raise my glass in this White House of ours to welcome the wonderful Prince of Wales and his lovely Lady David. <laughs> the ballerina suddenly treated me like a runaway bicycle. What did he say? I said, nothing. He's just thinking of next weekend at Camp Diana. <laughs> then I noticed the musicians beginning to put away their instruments one by one. <laughs> and I said, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, for having invited us here tonight. Well, I had to say something else. I couldn't just... <laughs> so I said, you won't remember this, sir, but about 40 years ago, I invited you for dinner in London, and we dined together at a restaurant called Les Ambassadeurs. He said, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, golly. Which ambassador was that? Well, about eight years ago, I was invited to celebrate, to join in the celebrations of Helmut Schmidt's 70th birthday in Hamburg. And I tra traveled a great deal. I told them I'd met several people who wished they could have been there, but couldn't owing to circumstances, including a couple in the White House who were too busy packing at that time. <laughs> but I speculated on what might have happened had they been able to come. I want to just give you this little thought, which I've, in your own great language, I've been working on. <laughs> Let me get this right now. Ich bin ein Hamburger. <laughs> I never had the privilege of meeting Mr. Bush, but I followed the campaign, and I fancy that I know the exact moment on which he lost it. One day he said on television, the American people are looking for leadership. I've got Mr. Clinton's voice, but I haven't got a text yet. <laughs> but I had 
the great pleasure of uh, meeting and talking to Jimmy Carter the other day, and I had to make a speech in his presence, and I said that most uh, people, with the, the very rare people who become president of the United States, often use the law as a stepping stone to the Senate or the Congress or a governorship, and then they use those positions as stepping stones to the presidency itself. But uh, Mr. Carter is the only man that I know of with the vision and with the humility to have used the presidency as a stepping stone to the ex-presidency. <laughs> And he's accomplished many things which he could never do as a president. And one mustn't blame Bill Clinton for not being able to do them because until he himself is an ex-president, he won't be able to shine in the same way that Jimmy Carter has. <laughs> so I think it should be included in the American Constitution that there's not only a vice president, but an ex-president. <laughs> I mentioned this to Jimmy Carter. He said, there'll be plenty of time to think of that when I've gone. <laughs> uh, but he told a charming story also, in case you haven't heard it, about Miss Lillian, his mother, who was interviewed by an extremely abrasive woman journalist who said to her, Mrs. Carter, is it true that in the whole of your life you've never told a lie? And that you also brought up Jimmy never to tell a lie? And Mrs. Carter said, well, well yes, I, I've never consciously told a lie. I'll say that, and certainly I never had to punish Jimmy when he was small for having told a lie. <laughs> you mean to say that you've never on any occasion told a lie? <laughs> I can't think of having, oh, well, of course, I might have told a white lie. <coughs> ah, said the journalist, writing furiously. Can you give me an instance of a white lie? And Mrs. Carter said, um, yes, I think I can. When you first come in here, I said I was glad to see you. <laughs> I think it's safe now to tell you a true story about Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> we were very impressed and, and moved by the fact she invited us to lunch, my wife and I, at 10 Downing Street. I'd known several of the previous incumbents. They'd never asked us to lunch, why should they? But Mrs. Thatcher, we didn't know from Adam, and she invited us to lunch. <laughs> I couldn't think why. And then I discovered that this lunch was going to be in honor of Mrs. Vigdis Finnbogadottir, <laughs> the president of Iceland. And I remembered that I'd been in Iceland because they were doing a play of mine at the National Theatre. And uh, I, I, I don't want to use this platform as a place from which to blow my own trumpet. <laughs> but it was the most enormous success. <laughs> it ran four nights, which is unprecedented in Reykjavik. <laughs> and I also discovered that Mrs. Finnbog, our daughter, before becoming president, was the general secretary of the Icelandic National Theatre. And I had to go and visit her in order to change my ticket for the first night. And I said to her, Mrs. Finnbogger daughter, Yes? Um, you, you've given me a ticket for the premiere in the middle of a row. Now, it is a tradition in the theatre that on a premiere, the author sits on an aisle so that he can leap onto the stage if it's called for, or else leave the theatre in a hurry. <laughs> She said, what seat have I given you? I said, you've given me uh, L12. Oh, yes, that's in the middle of the Yeah, I can let you have uh, K1. I said, that sounds much better. Yes, here's K1. Yeah. <laughs> Give me L12 back again. I can still sell it. <laughs> that was the extent of our negotiation. It doesn't sound very important now, but it was strangely important at the time. Why? Because no sooner did I leave Iceland after my, after my triumph um, <laughs> that Mrs. Finnbogadotir was elected to be president of the republic. 
And not long after that, war broke out between Britain and Iceland. It was called the Cod War. Everybody's forgotten it now, it was too ridiculous, and uh, it was a kind of wet run for the Falkland Islands. <laughs> and consequently, Mrs. Finbogger Dotter hadn't enjoyed her presidency at all. She'd been at home dealing with the war effort, and now she was coming over to London to reopen the embassy and to mend the hedges. Uh, she hadn't yet had the opportunity to travel, and consequently, she knew very few people abroad. She knew me because I had changed my ticket. <laughs> and I quickly realized that we were on the Icelandic list for the lunch and not on Mrs. Thatcher's list at all. <laughs> it became very clear as we sat down to lunch because we were just opposite Mrs. Thatcher and obviously my presence was spoiling her whole lunch. She's not a woman who could disguise her sentiments if these are strong enough. Eventually, she could bear the tension no longer. She said to me, what are you doing here? <laughs> I tried to explain. I must say, Mrs. Finbogger daughter was a wonderful help. She said, eight way <laughs> I said, yes, K1. <laughs> it was all a little overdrawn, but it did help Lady Thatcher to understand why I was there. And she became much sunnier over the dessert. And she even went at one point before we left, she said to me, why don't we see you here more often? I said, because the president of Iceland doesn't come over here. <laughs> well, I think comedy and laughter, especially laughter, is a wonderful, a wonderful human expression. We are the only things in nature to be able to laugh. I know that they say that some animals can laugh, hyenas, for instance, they can do nothing else. <laughs> and it's not a very joyous laugh in any case. It's a, it's a pretty miserable laugh. I know there are many old ladies with small dogs who say that the dog is smiling at you. Be very careful, that's the moment before they bite. <laughs> And sometimes optimistic young mothers touchingly say that their children like you because they appear to be on the verge of laughing. That's usually due to some transitory digestive disorder. <laughs> so I'm always fascinated to see what makes people laugh in different parts of the world. And I heard the following story in Moscow almost 30 years ago. People don't believe me, they say it couldn't have been as long ago as that. Of course it was, because in those days there was great tension and laughter was absolutely necessary. Nowadays it's still tension, but it's so loose that one really can't expect much laughter yet. This is the story of the old Jewish gentleman who's allowed to immigrate from the Soviet Union and arrives with all his earthly belongings at Sheremetyevo Airport in Moscow to be confronted by one of those very forbidding Soviet customs officers who only look forbidding, they're actually rattled with complexes. <laughs> and this man said, please open. And the old man opened his suitcase. The customs officer suddenly found something hard and heavy wrapped in a copy of Pravda, undid it, a bust of Lenin. What's that? The old man said, you shouldn't ask what's that. You should ask, who is that? That's Lenin, the father of socialism, who showed us the golden road leading to paradise on earth. Now that I'm going to Israel, I want to take him with me. Oh, какой сумочечек. Какой дурак. All right, grandfather, take it. And after a while, the old man arrives in Ben-Gurion airport. Now, he is confronted by the Israeli customs officer. First of all, good morning. Please to open. Finds the same thing and does it. So, what's that? You shouldn't ask what's that. You should ask who is that? That's Lenin, the son of a bitch. <laughs> 
who gave my people so much trouble for prevented we should emigrate to Israel. Now that I'm here, I want to cash! Oh, no, no, not here. Come on, take it away here. Oh, the old people here. So, after a while, he's in his new home with new relatives he's never seen and one small boy who's fascinated, 12-year-old, fascinated by this sudden acquisition of an uncle, and the old man comes in, puts down his suitcase, opens it, takes out the shirt, takes out the underwear, takes out Lenin, peels him, put him down, and the young boy says, Uncle, who's there? You shouldn't ask who's there. You should ask what is there. Eight kilos of gold. In a very tawdry work in the middle of Siberia somewhere, tawdry works, the foreman is working late in his office trying to do the accounts for the week. Into the office comes a not unattractive char lady with her pail and mop. Ignat Ilvoevich, you still here? Still working? The others are all going home, you know. The night shift's coming on, you're still here? Yes, I've got to finish these accounts. I can't do them. Oh, my dear, come on, we must all help each other. Hard times. <laughs> the eight's in the wrong column. I can see that from here. That had me. And they start again, and they finish the accounts at about one in the morning. They're exhausted. They're leaning heavily on each other, philosophizing about family life. They're so close to each other, they start necking, and then they start kissing. And before she knows it, she's in her underwear, running across to lock the door. And he says, why are you locking the door? We're not drinking. <laughs> Bosnia, in happier days too, the men wore beautiful folk costumes and smoked long pipes and lay in the high grass. The women are not quite so attractively dressed, but they're a little more active. And into this uh, idyllic scene comes an American exchange professor at the wheel of his car, sees a couple of columns of smoke rising from the high grass, knows there must be Bosnians there, and calls out, is this the right road to Sarajevo? Is this the richtige Straße for Sarajevo? E questa la buona strada per Sarajevo? And he motors off. And one Bosnian says to the other, you know, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. It would help us so much if we only spoke foreign languages. <laughs> and the other Bosnian says, didn't help him. <laughs> the Irish contribution towards laughter has been uh, absolutely uh, out of all proportion to their size as a people. I was in Dublin the other day and the man carrying my luggage in the airport said, follow me, sir, I'm right behind you. <laughs> it's always been assumed that the French are richer in wit than they are in humor. I don't think that's quite true. I think they have their own rather terse, succinct form of humor. One of Cousteau's men was walking along the ocean bed when the phone went in his earpiece. Is that you, the diver? Yes. Come up at once, we're sinking. <laughs> and there's a story which I got from the, gui uh, the official guide to Australia. Nobody seems ever to have read it, and so it's always come as a great surprise to everyone I tell it. But it's a true story, which I find enchanting. It's the story of Captain Cook, who landed in Australia in the 18th century and started making some extremely valuable perceptions of flora and fauna. And one day he had a very rude shock. He saw his first kangaroo, 
And you can imagine if you don't know the existence of such a thing, uh, or the, or, and you've never seen one before, it comes as a considerable shock. There was no one he could share it with, except one old Aboriginal gentleman who was sitting chipping at a rock. Uh, yeah, uh. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Sir, what, what, it, what is that? I, it, do you see it over there with the, with the kind of... I haven't got my glasses, but it looks as though it has an attaché case in front of it. <laughs> yes. Oh, look! <laughs> oh, capital! Yeah, yeah. Oh, capital. Yeah. What is it? And the old man said, Kangaroo! And it's been known as a kangaroo ever since. But since then, there have been great researches into the different Aboriginal languages, which are, of course, only spoken, not written. And by now, a dictionary is soon coming out. And it's been discovered that in that part of Australia, kangaroo means, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Well, of course, now we are all countries with uh, mixed cultures. This wasn't true when I was young. Only the United States was that, and even so, I knew nothing about the United States when I first went there. I knew nothing about the Constitution or the rule of the road or anything, and they had never seen me before. And I arrived in New York with instructions, with a small Italian car with Italian plates, and instructions to drive straight to Ottawa. Well, I found the freeway easily enough and was driving along in the usual European manner of the period at a comfortable 90 miles an hour <laughs> when I noticed some coloured lights behind me and I remember thinking how very inconsiderate to drive an ambulance at that speed with a sick person in it. I went up to 100, 110 and the coloured lights accompanied me and I began to think for the first time that maybe it wasn't an ambulance after all. And I rushed up the ramp of a Howard Johnson restaurant and hid among the larger cars. It was in time to see the police flash by with two outriders on motorbikes. I went in and had a complicated milkshake and looked at my road map and saw that by going on the country roads for eight miles, I could rejoin the freeway further up and continue my journey unmolested. Unfortunately, the police had the same idea. And when I got to the entry to the freeway, there they all were, some of them in rather melodramatic poses. <laughs> and one of these huge hulks came up to me and said, It was you in a small foreign sports car doing 110 mile an hour in the freeway in New York. I said, Scusa, uh, io non parlo inglese. <laughs> Sono arrivato adesso da Napoli e deve continuare in direzione di Ottawa, allora lasciami parlare. And he said, era lei in questo piccolo macchina di sport a pregare. There are days on which I don't like mixed culture. Now perhaps I may leave you in the good hands of Professor Dr. 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 Wait a moment. Uh, prof Dr. 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 Egon Reichmüller, is that right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> you left out one doctor, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm here on behalf of the Bundesregierung Deutschland in order to celebrate the, uh, the still further, uh, 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 still further, <laughs> the cultural links between our countries. Verdammt <laughs> nochmal. And I am the curator of the Museum der Musikwissenschaft der Mittelalterlichen Jahre pro Musik Antica in Kaffes. <laughs> this is the museum with the largest collection of musical fragments in the world. 
perhaps even in Europe. <laughs> and we bring you tonight for the first time anywhere a work which would not be possible until the two Germanys once again, they, uh, the, uh, the <laughs> It is an oratorio by Johann Sebastian Bach, written at the age of two years, <laughs> or even, as some musicologists insist, several years before that. <laughs> it begins with the aria for the contralto, Ach, lieber Gott, sei doch nicht böse. God, don't be angry. Then comes the recitativo of the evangelist. Ja, ja, die kleine Propheten kamen alle nach Toronto. <laughs> yes, yes, the minor prophets all came to Toronto. And it ends with the Gloria, which is one of the jewels of early German music. My friends, it is a very short work. But when you are two years old, <laughs> yeah, 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 you have other problems. That's the reed without the oboe. Tag sagte der Herr, hier komme ich nicht weiter, aber ja, die kleinen Propheten kamen alle nach Toronto und manchmal sogar nach Mississauga. Gloria, Gloria, Oh, 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 oh,
very short flamenco. La señorita con los ojos amarillo. Enamorado del toro, muerte en la corrida. Oh. La señorita con los ojos amarillo. Oh. Well, perhaps I could be a little more serious just for a moment. When you travel these days, you often see things which are extraordinary and which are now accessible and which weren't earlier on. And if you travel, however, for UNICEF or some such organization, you often have things thrust into your consciousness which you couldn't have known before. First of all, that the architecture of poverty is the same in every country. It's always uh, cardboard boxes with a little uh, uh, corrugated iron where that is possible. And there are other things which worry me a great deal. For instance, I remember when I was at school in England, um, for my first school, I used to be, have my hands washed and behind the ears, all that dreary ritual, in order to be fit to listen to a lecture from a frightful bore who came with lantern slides to divert us. And now I am the frightful bore. I arrive in Kenya or in Ethiopia, some country where I really don't know the language at all. And there the children are with gifts, with ribbons in their hair, freshly washed and dressed and expecting something huge to happen. And I just can't offer it. I thought to myself, there must be some other way of communicating than merely talking. I remember then visiting art galleries and seeing pictures by great masters from various centuries. And sometimes you'd see pictures of men with huge hats with feathers all over them, standing like this in a countryside. Nobody in his right mind would dream of standing like that today. <laughs> Very often it's a general who's pointing away from the battle which is going on there. <laughs> I can understand that. And the women are dressed are in, in absolutely impossible clothes. And on the ground is invariably a dog looking exactly as they look today, seeming to look at all these people and saying, what the hell are you up to now? <laughs> so I understood the, the link. And I looked to the children as if I'm going to speak to them. And then my manner changes imperceptibly. The children are terrified. <laughs> then you see it dawning on them. He's rather overdressed to be a dog. They're not quite sure 
It becomes a wonderful game, this outflanking. It's a wonderful game until there are ten of them on your back and a line forming to climb on. <laughs> then you have to change immediately and make them forget the dog. And I have a whole repertoire of things I can become at a moment's notice. Al Capone's car. <laughs> Or the baby Austin of the same period. Uh. <laughs> or the old Humphrey Bogart films. Uh. Yes. I'm not so well. Send him right up. <laughs> Even windshield wipers when there isn't sufficient rain to accommodate them. Uh. 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 Oh, an infinity of things. But my most uncanny moment at this sort of game was in China, in Gansu province, the poorest of all the Chinese provinces. There were three, between three and four hundred children in a cave, and they were remarkable children. They seemed to have some kind of subliminal contact with things just out of earshot or just out of sight. And perhaps because they looked so poetic, I attempted to be a dove. Awfully difficult thing to be especially when your throat is dry after two hours of games. But I tried it all the same for the first time. <coughs> 400 Chinese children followed the flight of the imaginary bird. The most uncanny moment of my life. I have no idea why they all turned in the same direction. And it just proves that on those jaunts, there's always much more to learn than there can possibly be to teach.